Hello, hello. Hey everyone, uh, if you guys want to grab a seat, come on in. We're going to get started here. Uh, feel free to grab some seats if, if you like. Uh, so I'm Artie Merritt, one of the co-founders and CEO of Dashbot. I appreciate you guys all coming out. Uh, so first, I just want to say thanks to Samsung. They let us use uh, the space here. They're one of our investors. If anyone's looking for investment or you're working on a startup idea, uh, they have a couple different programs. Uh, they've been really helpful to us, uh, not just for letting us use the space, but introing us to other investors and uh, potential customers and all. So, Definitely something uh, to look into, and if you have any questions, there are some Samsung people here, or feel free to come up to us and we can try to make the intro zone. So just before we get started, I just wanted to show a, a quick demo of um, Dashbot. Uh, how many people are building chatbots right now, either text-based chatbots or voice skills? You know? Cool. Um, so we're an analytics company for chatbots or voice skills, anything that's more text-based, like the Facebook chatbots or web-based chatbots or Alexa, uh, voice like Alexa or Google Home. And this is actually a live ticker on the site. So we processed uh, almost 75 billion messages since we launched a couple years ago. So I just want to show a handful of the reports. What you're seeing here, this is actually the dashboard for um, a sample movie bot. I think of looking up uh, movies like Fandango, but via Facebook Messenger, via conversation. We actually just updated our nav, trying to make it a little bit more easier to uh, access that. So if anyone uh, might have noticed that uh, earlier today, any of the folks using it. So some of our metrics are what you think of as traditional metrics, things like your users or sessions, engagement, like uh, how much time per session, sessions per, per user, retention metrics, like what percentage of users come back each day, week, or month. These are just the normal standard table stakes analytics. Um, where our platform becomes much more interesting is when you start actually looking at the, the conversations themselves and the messaging. In a report like this, what this is showing is these are the top messages people are either uh, are sending to your chatbot, saying or writing into the chatbot. And what we can do here is pick any one of the messages. Like if I pick hello here, we can go into a message funnel. And what this funnel is showing is when users say hello to the chatbot, what was happening on the left, what was happening on the right, and you can navigate the flow. So it helps identify where the chatbot might be breaking down. Like if you look at your I don't know message um, or error message, what did users say before that? So you can decide whether you want to add support for that or not. And if you can see here, these messages are all virtually the same. They're greetings. People asking uh, or saying hello, hi, hey, howdy. So instead of having to pour through all these things manually and, and individually, we created what we call phrase clusters. And this groups similar messages together. It's a semantic grouping. Um, and it can help identify where your NLP might be breaking down. Like in this case here, see this, it's a little bit faded on the screen, but um, what this is showing is all these messages, our algorithm is basically saying, is effectively the same, users asking for help. And this column over here is what the developer mapped it to the intent. So in some cases, the messages are being mapped correctly, like I need help is going to help. Uh, other cases, they're hitting the I don't know uh, fallback intent, so I need your help. And then in other cases, it's hitting things that are completely unrelated to help. So this can help you identify those mishandled and unhandled intents, and then you can uh, update your NLP engine, whether it's dialogue flow or whatever else you're using. And just to even make that a little bit uh, easier, if you just want to know the unhandled, like where it's breaking down, we have a specific report for that. So. Similarly, these are the individual messages that are hitting the fallback I don't know intent. And then um, we can group those together. And you can see here, thank you is one of the more common things our chatbot is saying, I don't know what you're asking me. And you can see over time whether that's uh, increasing or decreasing. Um, and then some of the other stuff we, we have here is comparison metrics. There's um, behavior, so you can see uh, whether you're achieving your goals or not, whether that's conversions around purchasing, sign up for things, or maybe it's, in the case of customer service, wanting to track escalations, like where uh, the chatbot might be breaking down. So if I pull that up here, it just takes a second to load. What, what this report will show is um, what percentage of the uh, users were escalated up to a, uh, an agent versus um, being contained by the, the chatbot. Live demo. 
uh, so I just loading it now. It takes a little bit because there's a lot of data there. Um, at a high level, you see in the first part about 55% of the users were contained. Uh, about 45% were escalated. It's all based on the intent. You can pick whatever the intent is. You know, so if it was a purchase intent, you pick that final uh, completion and see what the, the conversion was. And you can see over time. But what's a little bit cooler is actually going into the path. So what led to that escalation? And these are the quick high level view of what led to it. But you can dive in deeper and actually pull up the transcripts and jump in and actually see uh, what occurred. Like. What, what was the user doing? What, what was the response of your chatbot um, that led to that escalation? Uh, you know, is there someone here I can talk to? And similar to that, a lot of folks like to look at our, our transcripts. So we have uh, all these transcript reports. Instead of having to pour through and look at them all individually to try to figure why should I look at this transcript or not, we added some flags for if something's an outlier or not. So in this case, it's saying, um, the person repeated the same thing 10 times it, within the message. Or you might see things like, oh here, they texted human, or, or any other anomaly. And then to make this easier, you can actually filter and just say, show me all the outliers, and it'll pull up all the anomalies. So instead of having to go through all the transcripts, you can just quickly see you know, which of the ones where something went wrong, and how can I you know, look to see what was happening in the context there. Um, and then if you do have NLP, if you're making use of NLP, there's all kinds of uh, reports around the intent. Uh, you know, what were the top intents? In this case, it's a movie bot, so the top intents are all related to looking up a movie. Um, you can enter into the message funnels, the transcripts from here, or you can dive in deeper into the uh, entities as well. So if your uh, intents have entities, like if you're looking up a movie in a particular location, the location is the entity, you can filter all around those things. Like, if I do that here, real quick. Uh, this purchasing a ticket, these are all the different entities. You can filter and say, you know, show me all the ones in California and perhaps a certain city of Los Angeles. And we'll see the combination of intents here uh, that were sent in with that, um, sorry, combination of entities that were sent in with that intent. So just a way to better understand what people are, are doing inside your chatbot. There's a whole slew of more stuff in there around segmenting your audience and uh, broadcast messaging and all that. But I just wanted to show some of the high level reports. Um, so without further ado, we're actually going to uh, jump into the, the panel here, so if the panelists can come up and grab a seat. So we have, actually have a great uh, lineup uh, of, of folks tonight. So maybe um, just very quickly, if, if folks can go down and just quickly say who, who you are, you know, um, what company you work for, what you guys are doing in the chatbot space, and then we'll get uh, started. Watson Developer Labs and AR VR Labs, where I did a lot of work on conversational interfaces from chatbots, voice bots, IoT devices, all the way to conversation in AR and VR. Uh, hey everybody, my name is uh, Brian Plaskin. I work at Realogy as a senior product manager. Uh, uh, my product is uh, Agent X Voice Assistant. It's a voice assistant for real estate agents. Kind of unique because it's enterprise B2B and not consumer facing like a lot of you know voice skills are. Um, tell you a bit, about, uh, a bit more about it uh, in a few. Um, I did bring a lot to share, so if at any point you want me to wrap it up and move on, just give me a hand signal or something, we'll, we'll keep it going. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> this works. I'm Antonio, I'm a senior software developer at Reprise, um, and over there we work a lot 
uh, with different brands and using uh, Facebook Messenger bots, Alexa skills, and Google Assistant actions. Hi. Hi. I'm uh, Alec Truitt. I work at Google on the uh, Google Assistant, and I focus on global product partnerships. So looking at new capabilities, new functionality that we can add into the Assistant uh, to then enable developers like yourselves to build on uh, the Assistant. So just to start it all off, uh, what types of use cases are you building chatbots or voice skills for, either for yourself, or your clients, uh, or you know what you're seeing too? Anyone's? Oh, me? Oh, okay. Anyone? No, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Okay, I'll steal. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a few use cases. Uh, well, first, sometimes brands will come to us and just be like, uh, "We want to be the first on this platform." Um, so that's tends to be because it's a brand new space. Um, there's a few other use cases, uh, pushing products. Uh, so on Facebook Messenger, linking out the products on different, um, on different websites. Uh, other areas are giving users valuable information, uh, like smaller updates or um, FAQs, that type of thing. Um, yeah, that's uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, so um, at IBM, we work with individual developers like you all in the room, all the way up to Fortune 20 companies. And what we notice is the most common use case is, is customer care. So people that are creating bots can go anywhere from like an insurance company, a telecom company, all the way to banking bots. And they come to IBM to use it because of our infrastructure that allows them to build something at a larger global scale and then also have very sensitive information. Um, captured within our systems in a way that is compliant with their country and whatever industry regulation they have. The other tier of bots that we see a lot being built on are empathetic bots. So people are using IBM's empathy suite, which includes things like tone analyzer, personality insights, um, so that you're adding to maybe your like, customer care bot. So when you come in, and say like, I had a horrible experience today, then the bot is able to understand that and say, I'm sorry to hear that and go through a different decision tree than, um, you know, love your experience. That's great, let's continue. And that empathy suite is, even while it gets added on to customer care, people are using it to build for a lot of things like therapy, uh, training, um, education, anything that we want to have a layer of personalization to. Reality, yeah, absolutely. I uh, want to learn more about that empathy thing because right now our voice assistant is a punching bag <laughs> for uh, real estate agents. So uh, real estate agent, their you know their day to day can be a bit chaotic. They have need uh, for information, and that information can be in a lot of different places. So in a nutshell, the voice assistant is designed to be a voice interface to productivity tools and market intelligence. Uh, throughout the all phases of an agent's day. So say they're getting ready in the morning, they wanna say, you know, start my day with agent X. You're gonna get um, listing status information, you know, some property details, your appointments, things of that nature, old hat. But, you know, the real power comes in when you're, when an agent is in a uh, listing presentation with a, with a seller um, and they want to know, well, how, what is the average time on market for a property in this area? Um, what is the average listing price? Things of that nature. Being able to ask Agent X means you don't have to bring out a laptop, you don't have to get your phone up, you can just ask and get the information that you need. What are you seeing folks building yeah. for? So from a voice perspective, I think we kind of separate it into three categories. So one would be at home. So think about kind of cooking a recipe, playing music, um, you know, turning off the lights, looking at your front door in terms of the doorbell. Um, and then mobile, so being on the go, so it could be playing a game, uh, it could be looking up um, you know, how far away is the closest train. Um, and then, um, so you have, then you would also have um, in the car, so kind of on the go, um, so being able to communicate messaging. So we kind of bucket it into those three groups and then we'll typically see use cases that are really driven around context. So a lot around voice is just making sure that you're building actions with the mind of when is the user using this action? Uh, so communicating via voice and then how are they looking to use it? Um, so if you're in the car, um, you're probably not gonna be able to use your hands. So, um, or if you're at home and you're cooking a recipe, um, you want something that'll typically, let's say if it's a visual home device, um, something that's very rich in terms of engagement um, with the user. So I think that's a big piece of designing for context um, in some of these use cases. Are, are there any uh, 
uh, use cases that you think work particularly well for either voice or text-based chatbots? Yeah. Other than the ones you build, I mean, are there things that you think really stand out? Like maybe you guys are working on. Yeah, so I can share a little yeah, bit. Yeah. In terms of, so I would say um, an example would be if let's say you had food order, right? So a very con if you're ordering from a restaurant for the first time and you have a particular pizza, um, it's a very complex order. Maybe not the best use case for voice. Um, but if let's say it's the same restaurant, you always order, you know, a pepperoni pizza and you know a, a garden salad. Um, that's a use case where you're kind of reordering, where it would be a great opportunity to build something for voice. So I think it's kind of thinking through kind of um, maybe not as complex uh, type of engagement. So if you think about it, you don't want to have a ton of back and forth of, okay, what type of restaurants are near me? What type of pizza restaurants? What types of pizza would you like? Um, things that are more simple uh, interactions. And then um, I'd say from a gaming perspective, um, if let's say you have, keep in mind if you're building for something that has a display or doesn't, so that kind of would, um, if it doesn't have a display, maybe something like quizzes versus if you have a display that's where you can have some more rich content. Um, you're kind of building where it could have a social aspect, it could not. Um, so you, there's a variety of different ones depending on the context of the user. Yeah, yeah so uh, you mentioned simplicity, right? One of the more popular intents that we have is just listing information, right? So um, an agent busy in their day, like I said, they're just like, oh, um, what are my expiring listings next week or next month? That's very popular, you know, intent, something very simple, you know, it's read access, you, you know, you're looking for a listing status, something like that. Or, um, oh, I can't remember that property, uh, tell me new listings in Madison, New Jersey between 500 and 600K. Okay, there it is. Like that, that sort of simple kind of, you know, I guess call and retrieve type use case. Yeah, it, it definitely. It, you reminded me that uh, there's a, one of the, folks, the developer that has a, a voice game on our platform, it, we just see like one interaction in and they were stopping and we finally went and played the game. When you launch the game, the very first thing it said is go to www, you know, <laughs> fill out this form and then you're on your Google Home, right? Like it's not the context. Uh, I'll add one thing to that. I think it's important as you're building your bot to recognize that humans talk and type differently. So when you're creating your bot, whether it be a voice bot or a, a text bot, know what the use case is. If it's a quick one-time transaction, then it, it could be fine to be text. But if it's something you're gonna build on, like what's the weather, it's going to rain, what time will it start raining, maybe that sort of rapid fire is better suited for voice. And then there's also an element of trust. So would you like, are you more likely to trust something that happens on a computer where you're verifying identity or through voice? The next question is, is the element of trust, plus what you were talking about earlier, the uh, empathetic thoughts, uh, like how yeah, it, do those folks, I mean, how does that combine? Like, do the folks tr trust you when, you're, when they're doing these things? I guess the educational ones or therapy ones, like how does that work? Yeah, I think this is kind of where the future of bot building is going. A lot of it's about identity of the bot. And I think people, as they were creating bots, they were doing it for efficiency or to automate something. But now all these bots that are getting created, you form relationships with them. Children are going, growing up with Alexas and at home with bots that have been anthropomorphized and are part of the family. So I, I think having that empathetic bot that with voice is important if it's a part of your home and it's something that's teaching children about something or it, it adds a layer to your everyday life rather than like get this done, right? You don't want to be bossing someone around. You don't want to be, um, you know, you don't want to say please and thank you because that's also a little weird, I don't know. So you, you kind of have to think through where it makes sense and where it doesn't and which situation it makes sense. Context, I think, is super important. Car versus home versus, you know, walking on the street. So how about um, for you all that have been building the skills, did you give the skill of personality? Does Agent X have a personality? or? Uh, yeah, we try to, so, you know, knowing that our, our real estate agents range from type A to type A, uh, we, we try to make sure that we, 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 in business to business, we keep the cuteness to a minimum. I mean, there, people, user, users have expressed interest in personality, but, um, you know, again, during that chaotic 24-hour cycle of, of, their, of the nature of their business, like, you know, the, the voice skill right now is uh, just trying to be as helpful and productive as possible rather than your friend. But I think there's there's room. There's definitely room that we can get there. Yeah. I think you guys are doing personality stuff for three parts, right? From 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so a few of our, this is probably more in the chatbot space, but um, we have uh, copywriters that'll try to come up with the voice of the brand and come up with a name for that person and give a very good description of what that person does, what do they talk like, um, and then we'll use that in all the copy that we use inside of our bots. Um, so this way, from beginning to end, it feels like that you're talking to the brand because um, I'm no brand expert as a developer, but I, I know it's important to have the same voice of the brand throughout the entire experience, whether it's on the internet or if it's on Alexa or Google Assistant. Yeah, and how about um, like the customizable uh Voices around using the default voice versus say uh, you know, having a, a voice app for DC. Do you guys make use of that? Or do you see that? We're interested in that. Yeah. But TBD, but yeah, we want to get there. And do you, what do you guys see? Like, is that different on the Google side or even building for clients? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be really interested to get something like that. I know there's something called Lyrebird, um, and Lyrebird. it's, yeah, it's, a uh, is that what it's called, right, Lyrebird? I, I use it to train a model on my voice, but it sounds like uh, me and a robot had a child, um, so it's not something that I want to use. Um, but if there'd be a way to, uh, you know, train someone's voice and create a model from it and then be able to call an API to have the text that you want to say as a person's voice, I think that allows for the more um, personal interactions. Um, for example, if you were working, uh, making a skill for Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Fallon was talking back to you, you would love that way more than hearing, uh, no offense, Alexa or Google's voice um, because they're just not as personable. And that's where you kind of see something, like we have the John Legend voice, for example. I, I, think, I think that's where we kind of, if you think of the steps of building an action, uh, so a voice action, you kind of have the foundational ones in terms of making sure that it actually works, they're able to get the information they're looking for. Um, you have kind of the essential functionality of maybe you kind of layer in some visuals, you make it more interactive, and then delight. So okay, how can we make this kind of more fun? And especially when you're working with a brand, they want their brand to come through to complement what they're building and, and kind of how these customers are interacting with their brand. So um, those are definitely things that we're looking at is how do you kind of obviously make it work, but then how do you make this interesting and something that someone wants to continue to interact with versus, oh, I used that once, that was fun, and all right, now I'm on to the next thing. Um, how do you kind of get that continued engagement? And a lot of that is through that personalization kind of brand engagement, uh, which the voice can do. Yeah. We also see, like, most clients will come in and say, we want a voice that does this. We, we want to get a voice actor. We want to do all these different things. But a lot of times, you don't actually need a voice, right? If, if it's Jimmy Fallon, it makes sense that Jimmy Fallon's voice but what's your brand, right? Is it a robot? Then maybe you don't want Jimmy Fallon's voice with that robot. And people have different associations. So sometimes it's, it might be better to actually have a robotic voice because you're doing something that might not freak the other person out. And other times you want the actual voice. Um, maybe you're gaming and you're playing against a bot. In those scenarios, it makes sense to have that. So just think through the use case and what actually makes sense for your, your brand and voice to go through. Some, sometimes you hear folks will, um, maybe it's like a like Jeopardy trivia game, somebody had Alec asked the question, but then the answers are from the device itself. But, uh, we had a, a, an investor once use this, I, I, it's, it, I, the way he said it was interesting. If you see red and yellow, you know that's McDonald's, but then what's the voice for the brand? Like how do you, that hasn't been defined in some cases, kind of interesting. Um, so in, in general, voice, how do you guys go about it? I mean, you, you talked a bit about like the fire uh, but how do you um, how do you actually design for voice? You know, like what is concise and simple? And what are some of the tips you guys? Well, I brought a few. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you know, step one, of course, don't overthink it. You know, I know it's cliche. I got a bunch of cliches, but don't overthink it. You know, for instance, like you know, I could cartwheel to Penn Station, but it's easier to just walk. Right. So don't overthink it. The, the other thing, there's there's a great exercise. Regardless of what platform you're using, there's an exercise at alexa.design slash cdw, and it's the scripting exercise. I know you're saying, oh, I came all this way in the rain to be told to go do I'm telling you, this thing is the best. It's good for you know junior designers, experienced designers. Um, we, we reference it a lot because um, it forces us to, you know, to go through the thought process of like, what's the interaction going to be? I know it's the basics, but the basics are working for us, so we love that design exercise. The other thing that's really cool to check out you might want to Google an article called Understand How Users Invoke Custom Skills. Again, you're saying, Brian, this is day one stuff. 
but you know, it's it, it really works for us. There, that article is, um, you know, even if you're doing Google Assistant, I would say check that out because it'll help you add variety into the interaction model. Yeah, um, so. You hear me? Yeah. So uh, the, a lot of brands, I think, come in with the mindset of, oh, I want my website to become a chatbot or a voice skill. Um, and a website or anything with a graphical user interface was made to be, I want to click here to take me here, which will then take me here, which will then take me here. It's very vertical. You do one, two, three, four. Whereas when you're designing for voice, um, you want it to be horizontal. So you want to be able to get the steps one, two, three, or four by saying a very specific phrase rather than having the person go through one step, two step, three step, four step, because at that point then the user is just going to be like, I hate this thing. Let me shut this thing off and go on my computer or my phone because it's way easier to do that. If they're going to use it, it has to be easier to do. It can't be harder to do. And so just to kind of layer on top of that, I think it's important to remember that you, so not replicating what you already have, so not replicating your website or your app, but really trying to think through what is a great use case for this format, um, what is going to add value to the user, and then be faster to use. Because um, what we found is that there's actually very low tolerance in terms of users when they are using voice, and if it's not useful or they don't see the value right away, they'll jump to something else, open it on their phone. Um, but if they see that this is going to be a great use case, they'll actually invest extra time with that particular action. Um, so I think that piece in the beginning is just thinking through what should this value be. Uh, so for example, we were working with a brand, um, they have you know, many different hardware stores um, around the country, um, and they were originally building an action that basically just told the user where the closest hardware store was. Uh, but they forgot about context, they forgot about uh, leveraging existing data that you could access, so where the user is. So they were actually asking the user, where are you, or what's your zip code, um, versus those are things that the user just assumes that the action knows. Um, so at that point, we were seeing the drop off because users were like, well, this is just easier. I can just open you know, Google Maps, for example. Um, and then the other piece is uh, making sure that you're very clear from the beginning um, to set the expectations for what the action is actually doing. Um, so in this case, users thought, well, OK, maybe I can look up uh, what types of uh, products are at the store. I'm looking for a specific type of saw. This action, I should be able to ask Google and the assistant, and then uh, the action for this hardware store should be able to help me find it. But in reality, it only showed the user where the closest hardware store was. Um, so in that case, you would want to kind of be upfront in the beginning. Um, so that's a simple example, but I think it's true of just making sure that you set the expectations for the user at the beginning, especially when dealing with voice. Because uh, you don't, in some cases you have the visual, some cases you don't. But that way the user kind of has the mindset so when they do work horizontally, they know, okay, what is within bounds to be able to have this communication um, and be able to get what it is that they're looking to get out of it. So when you say, like, if someone uh, video calls that action right up the batter and say, I can help you with A, B, and C kind of thing? So that's where it can kind of start off. I'd say, the key to it is you only do that maybe once because you would then assume that, all right, now that the users use this a few times, you don't need to go through the full intro over and over and over again. Um, so the key is maybe like the first few times you're kind of explaining what it can do and then it's allowing the user to take those next steps as opposed to you know, repeating the next time. And that the one thing I'll add, those are all great tips, is like I said earlier, people talk and type differently. Different people talk differently. So when you're building out your voice assistant, make sure that you have a, a, a diverse set of data of how people are talking and interacting. And that's not just gender, but it's age, it's ge geography. Um, like if you're trying to book something, I wanna go to Toronto from New York, there's a huge difference between I wanna go from New York to Toronto, because the bot's gonna read it differently. So get as many people as you can and, and listen to them talk and see how they are talking and how they're communicating, and then how they communicate differently in different contexts. So if they're talking, in, uh, if they're at work or if they're at home, um, what changes? So, uh, and then people with different languages, accents, those things all make a difference, and you need to also um, account for that. At Watson, we trained this one bot all in screaming tone, <laughs> and it was Urban Dictionary in screaming tone. So the bot would only or understand if you're just screaming cuss words at it, and then it would respond to you and screaming cuss words. So like it's your your bot 
is only going to be good as the data you put into it. Uh, when, you, when, you're the, uh, sorry, when you're building these uh, skills, do you ever have, say, one person act like the device and one person you know, ask the question to see what it's really like? Do you do this kind of? I've never done that. That's a good idea. That's, that's part of that uh, scripting exercise for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, that's actually something we recommend. Before you even start building anything, you kind of just, you and another person go through a number of scenarios because, you know, as you mentioned, your, the user expects to be able to communicate with this device like it's another person. So, and they're going to do that in a variety of different ways. So we actually suggest doing that first and kind of picking different partners and kind of going through it and then documenting, okay, what are the different flows that the user could go through. But um, yeah, I'd say that's definitely right. Is the empathy team the same as the screaming urban dictionary? <laughs> it's not. It's not the same team. The screaming urban dictionary team was part of research that's building different things. The empathy team is trying to make money off our empathy state. Uh, I, I think I almost disagree with talking to, like, having someone pretend to be a assistant. Yeah, because I feel like the way you're going to talk to a device is very different from the way you'll talk to another human. So I, I don't know if that if that would work, but I think when you talk to another human, you're going to understand a lot about what they're trying to get to, and it could be a good baseline. But I, I, I think the next step would be having building something and then having a human talk to the the assistant and see what data you get out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I just built some demo skills and actions for ourselves. And if someone was to ask me about Dashbot, there's like a sentence or two I would send an email. But as soon as the device started saying it, I was saying stop within like three. Two or three words in is too long. Yeah, but something like that. Uh, we, yeah, we heard some people do those things. Um, cool. How about uh, in terms of like one of the biggest challenges we we often hear is around like, discovery, like user acquisition and discovery. In fact, we ran a survey where a lot of folks don't even know what these things are called. They think it likes to call some skills and really call some actions or a change the name. Um, what do you think works well for acquisition? Like, do you go about getting users? Any of I think it depends, right? I think I think it depends on what the bot is. Um, a lot of times, it's through word of mouth. Uh, most people discover apps through need, so I think need and and pleasure are the, probably the two reasons. Um, and and people have done a lot of marketing campaigns for like promoting their bot, um, and they don't necessarily work that well. And if your company is just a bot, then you're going to be marketing your company, so that's fine. So I, I think it, I think it depends on what it is, what the end goal is, um, and then a lot of people, um, the success of the bot depends on what the bot use case is. So if it's a quick transaction, you don't want them to be in the system for a very long time, and if it's um, a bot that's therapy, you want them to be in the system for a very long time. And, and because of that, I think the discovery changes a little bit, because if it's something that can happen very quickly and it's transactional, then perhaps you say, like, would you like to do this quicker through this system? Versus like something else would be, hey, here's an option. So the way you message it and the way you send it out, I think it depends on what the bot ultimately does. Um, Realty has... Uh a great family of brands. So Century 21, Cole, Banker, Sotheby's, to name a few. And so Agent X, we're looking to roll these out to the brands and you say, well, Brian, that's like, you know, it's a turkey shoot. You have a captive audience, but it's not that easy. And we found that in incentiv incentivizing work for us. It's kind of like cheating, but so earlier this year, Realogy had a, um, a conference of all the brands together. And so, they're like, well, you know, all you have to do is work with each marketing manager at the brands, and then you'll have 12,000 instant users. It wasn't that simple. I went to the brands and I said, look, in Vegas, we're going to have the global announcement of Agent X. And they're like, yeah, you and everybody else is going to have the global announcement. So I said, well, we're, we're going to be opening up early access to pilot users and we'll have new capabilities. Nothing. I said, I'll be giving away 100 Alexa devices. And they're like, Mr. Plaskin, right this way, would you like to be on that panel? Would you like to talk to the marketing managers? How about you come to our booth and you know, present on the trade show floor? So um, it's, does anybody remember when Dropbox did this? Dropbox had a scavenger hunt on their site. So you would go to lesser used features and then they'd give you, they reward you with additional space and then the bloggers picked it up and I heard about it. And, well, anyway, yeah, and, and incentives, uh, you know, channel, channel your inner game show host, 
and there's a little Steve Harvey in all of us. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So it's a very good example. Um, I think discovery, just to be honest, it's, it's something that we're still, I think, within the ecosystem and within the industry, we're tr still trying to figure out the best path, not just to kind of get the bump in terms of, okay, now we have someone that has the device, they're using it for Spotify to play music, but how do you expand it to other types of actions and interactions? Um, and then once you find one that you really like, how do you kind of keep coming back to it? And often cases, you'll find that someone may find a game because they'll say, hey, G, play a game. They'll then start playing a game, but they don't remember the name of it. They don't know how to get back to it. So that's something that we're really focusing on is how do we continue to grow that re-engagement? Um, right now, again, kind of within the ecosystem, it's pretty early, but that's a big question that we're trying to solve as well as, I think, in general in the industry. And then the other piece is when you do have those different promotions, some things that we're testing with some brands is kind of building the promotion that maybe has that big spike in terms of usage, but what are ways that we can frame the promotion so that way you're getting that ongoing engagement? Um, we're starting to test out some of those different um, strategies today, but um, definitely still very early in terms of that discovery side. Yeah, so, again. All right, um, so discovery, yeah, the um, invocation name is something that I found that was a huge problem. A lot of people, like you said, don't understand that there's skills and actions. They also don't understand that you need to say, ask invocation name in order to do that thing. Um, so I think education about the whole topic is a huge problem. Um, but if you have an invocation name, uh, I would try to associate it with something that's popular, either like a, a trend or um, a company, right? If you're working for a brand and it's a very well-known name, that's something that's easy to do. Um, so having something that's searchable, I think, helps a lot. Um, and then also, I know that there's a feature on Alexa for uh, being able to fulfill an intent when the user, uh, like the user might come to Alexa and say, I want to do X, and then it'll present a certain amount of uh, skills. I'm not sure if that's on. Yeah, we also get yeah. okay. Yeah, so Google does it too. Um, uh, yeah, so trying to take advantage of that this way when a user comes to it and you end up being the person that they surface, I think that helps a lot as well. Related to that, maybe an element of insights, I don't know, the attribution, that's something we get asked from time to time. How do you know where the person came from in your voice? So, so I would say, along with discovery, analytics is also yeah. another big area that we're building out. Um, we have, so at our developer conference this year, we announced a bunch of kind of new, uh, within the console, kind of different types of uh, discovery, but also other analytics and attribution metrics that should be launching later this year. Um, so I'd say stay tuned for those, but it's it's another big area because, so I think one piece is how do you build a great action, and how do you continue to kind of reiterate, then um, now you have someone that's using it, but how do you get them to re-engage with your action and keep coming back? In order to do that, you need great analytics to understand what's driving it and then how can I continue to improve it? Or if let's say there's an error or there are certain bugs, you need ways to analyze that as well. Um, so those are things that we're kind of building into that just to kind of continue to um, provide the right resources into the ecosystem. Yeah. We have an analytics question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, how about like users themselves, what do they think of these, the chatbots and voice skills that you guys are building or helping clients build? Like, do you ever get feedback say, from the Century 21 users what they think of uh, it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. We um, Before we set out for the pilot, we had a, a number of questions. So, like, in other words, well, so uh, to begin with, uh, do users, will they even understand how to interact with a voice assistant for real estate agents? Or, um, uh, you know, which commands are going to be useful and which ones aren't? So, uh, the combination of what answered that was dashboard analytics, frankly, and then also a combination of surveys, you know, keeping a very close pulse on, on the pilot as we went. And what we found was sentiment was overall good. Users do understand how to, how to use it. Dashbot showed us what, what was useful and what wasn't in no uncertain terms. That was great. Um, what we found, though, was there's a voracious appetite for new capabilities, right? So there's the things that we've provided to the users. If we give them read access to something, they want write. And then they want notifications and so on and so forth. So it's, you know, it, what we, we come to find is, yeah, again, positive sentiment, but they want more and they want it to you know, have a high level of accuracy in, in the interaction. Okay. Any other ones that you think? Yeah, we always recommend to 
bake in some like a fallback mechanism, right? If something breaks, then it says like, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I can do these six things. But then we also recommend to put in a feedback loop. Like, is there something that we're missing to do? Or it would be nice if you could do this and then capture that data and read it. Most of all, of, almost all of our internal IBM bots, they come with the thumbs up, thumbs down. So after we go through something, um, it, the bot goes, did I answer your question right? Or was that what you were looking for? And you get a thumbs up, thumbs down, and you can use that data to build into stuff. But um, I, don't, I haven't worked with a client that's come to me and said, like, I worked with this person that like, came and told me this piece of feedback. Most of the feedback is actually coming anonymously through the bot itself. Yeah, so um, we use actually Dashbot for analytics on a specific case with uh, Zyrtec uh, Google Action. Um, and we uh, realized that we had come up with the first version of this action and we realized that um, almost all of the intents weren't being used except like two of them. Um, and that was primarily because when we went back and looked at our flows of how we designed everything, those intents were actually the super complicated ones. They would ask you question after question after question. So using that and reading the reviews for our actions on Google, we realized that um, we need to change something. So we just uh, came out with a new version of it that was much more simplified. And uh, now we're planning on learning from those analytics as well. Um, so using the analytics, I think, is super important. Yeah, just uh, sorry for the plug, but we actually have a CSET uh, report coming out all around the thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, it's, it's something we hear for the customer service side of things. Um, what about the, the future? Where, where do you guys see chatbots or voice uh, voice skills going in the future? Like, what do you think maybe it needs to happen in the space for things to you know, take up more? Yeah, what do you see as the future? Yeah, so I, I kind of touched on this earlier. I think I think there's a trend of voice bots, chat bots, all that, but a concept of digital humans that I think are, are coming more and more into reality right now. So as people are building their bots, it's not just voice, but it, it's a physical, uh, well, a digital physical human with a face, facial features, reactions, and um, Air New Zealand is, is a customer that uses bots to digital humans, and they're stare, like, there's little robot-esque things. Um, so it could be the peppers, but it could also be like Link NYCs that are around where you just have people you can go into and talk to and they respond. Um, and I think the other thing that we're, we're seeing a lot with, with bots is, is the concept of like AI bias, right? So making sure that you're creating a bot that is um, capturing something on a more global scale. So this is where analytics and all that comes and to play, like it's very important to gather that data and see who's using it, and you constantly update your bot, um, and and you make sure that you're creating something that's moving with trends and is up to speed with everything around. Um, yeah, for Realogy, uh, the future is going to be you know new capabilities, obviously, where it makes sense. We're not just doing voice for voice sake. Uh, new capabilities, new platforms. Um, you know, but you know, if I was to wish what would be in the future of voice, what I'm hoping for is kind of like a generational leap, almost like when you go from like one video game console to like the next one, but it's like a, a big difference and not just like a point five. I'm hoping that the future of voice has some sort of generational leap that uh, maybe my vocabulary is tapping out to, but yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking, I think the future of voice, some sort of generational leap that will make, make the current generation look like like, oh man, that's like Atari graphics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this space has a lot of potential um, and I think people are starting to use it and get comfortable with them being in, your, in their homes, but I think there's three main areas where uh, there needs to be improvement. Like I said before, the education of knowing how to use these things uh, instead of just talking to them. Uh, second is discovery. How do I find the thing that I need? And then third is the user experience, which might be the one that we're the farthest ahead on. The good skills and actions and chatbots that are out there actually provide value to their users, and I think that's the most important thing that will ultimately get more people to start using them in the future. 
And just to kind of build on, I agree with, uh, with everything you guys have said as well. Um, so the, the other piece I would say is kind of thinking about not voice or chat, but kind of like individually, I would say, I think what, what I'm kind of seeing is that um, you'll start to see this kind of blending in terms of what makes the most sense based on the user's context, what they're looking to do, um, to where maybe it makes more sense if they're on their phone, maybe it's fulfilling via the app, but the voice is kind of jumping into that experience directly where it is taking into account. So let's say if you um, recently booked a flight on United and then it knows that you're already a Hertz member, for example, um, how could we kind of help that user kind of jump through uh, to the final result of booking the car versus normally you'd have to go onto the Hertz website and fill in your details of where you're flying to, the time that you're flying in at, the time that you're dropping off, and just kind of jumping through these hoops. How can we kind of speed up that process? So those are some of the things where you're kind of blending um, across using voice to kind of basically jump from the start to finish as opposed to kind of um, thinking of it, okay, I need to complete everything via voice or I need to do uh, the apps for these things or the web for these things. I think it's kind of, you're gonna to start to see a mix where, um, at least in the midterm, where some of these different um, options will start to work together um, and you'll see them connected versus right now it's fairly disjointed in terms of when you're working with, let's say like a Google Home versus on your phone versus your TV or your, your car. So I think you'll start to see that connecting um, and using voice is kind of that, that bridge between them. Google, but uh, actions have that handoff, you know, that the device is available, or a screen is available. Very similar, so early kind of concept, yeah. but like how can we do more of that, but also just customizing it to you. So customizing that experience, again, same kind of theme of at home, mobile, so on your phone or in your car, kind of, you know, moving around where you can't use your hands to do something. Um, how can we keep that same context, but also customization for you based on your features, what you like, um, and rather than you feeling like you have to restart that each time you start uh, an engagement. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is great. I, I want to see if uh, the audience has any questions for... Yeah, so you guys were talking about voice actors earlier and then you brought up the John Legend example. One of the things that I'm kind of worried about when you think about like speech engines where you take like a celebrity and you allow them to just kind of say whatever is that someone could like end up having John Legend say something that he did not say and then like his career gets ruined. So it's like... <laughs> Google thinking about those kinds of things and how voice actors are used on these systems. So I'd say uh, the way that it's set up, um, so with John Legend or any of the actors, it's actually limited to only specific use cases for, through certain Google engagements. Um, so you couldn't actually have uh, any celebrity kind of say anything. It's it's very restricted in terms of what it could be used for um, for that exact reason. Because just like, sorry to interrupt, but like there's this like Alexa app called Simon Says, you can say Alexa, Simon Says, and Alexa will say anything that you say after that. I just didn't know if that was the same kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So in the case of, let's say, the John Legend example, it's restricted to certain use cases. Have you heard of the, the concept deep fake? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I think it, it's, it's coming up a lot, this concept of synthetic media and what it means for audio and visual content, especially what it means for someone famous and, and for having them you know, do something that could influence, like, destroy their career, but also, like, if, if you take, I don't know, a, a government official that could influence our election, right? It, it has really large ramifications. Um, I don't think we've actually solved for it. And I think right now the, the technology isn't to a place where we could do that, but I think, I think people are getting there. And I think the AI is there, it's just not publicly available. So it, it's important for everyone to start thinking about that, whether it be your voice and what it means for your brand, all the way to, you know, John Legend. Uh, oh yeah, 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 so I'm curious about accessibility, say through genetics or through facts or something's happened to you, tracheotomy, Bell's palsy, stroke, victim, who knows, and it's affected your voice and it's distinctive enough where there's common traits for those subsets of people that have that. What is being done industry-wide to address that? And we'll get to it. That's so, yeah, so, uh, so I don't know if you saw the recent, uh, so Google I.O. this year, we actually presented on how we're actually taking different voice models. So we're actually having an accessibility um, study to be able to build that, that into the model. So that way, um, regardless of uh, accent or if you have um, certain um, needs, it's able to still understand. So that's actually something that's very top of mind. And it's also true um, globally. So as you go into different markets, there's different accents or variations in terms of language. Um, so it's making it so that way, regardless of kind of where you're from or, or, or kind of your background, 
um, or physical um, conditions, you're able to then still feel like you're able to interact and, and leverage that um, that technology to help you within your life. So um, I'd say early, but very, very top of mind in terms of building out that engagement. If you need a voice actor for a Jersey accent, <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are, there, and there, there, are no, no, there are actually, <laughs> in, kind of on that, there are ways that you're able to join those studies as well. Um, so in order to kind of expand it, um, so you, depending on kind of different accessibility, you can actually join those studies, which is pretty cool. Yeah, there's also a lot of research being done in like voice being very good for people who are blind. So if you look at the history of blindness and when Braille came in, there's been so many different, it's like a, almost like a dick waving contest of what's gonna be the right thing for them. So like right now, I think different people are figuring out how you can use voice to help different accessibility issues. And the only one that people are mainly doing research on right now is blindness. Um, I will say that there's a lot of research and a lot of use happening with autism and um, uh, people with like, neurodiverse issues to teach them kind of how to be more empathetic, right? So it could be a light that gives off to help someone figure out that this person is happy, this person is sad, and then it allows the human to help um, and respond. So it gives you that aid. Um, and I think what we believe at IBM is that uh, like AI and technology and all this there, it's not there as artificial intelligence, it's there as augmented intelligence. So you can use this technology to help your day-to-day -day and make things that you're doing to be easier, more efficient, you know, more helpful to create a more inclusive world. So there was a little bit of talk about people growing up with voice as like kids interacting with their Alexas, their Google Home. Um, how is the interaction one for understanding people at different age ranges, but also understanding how they will evolve in their relationship over time as, you know, infant to, you know, older person and, and how that will be played out. Any thoughts to that? I, I know a bunch of universities that are researching. These longitudinal studies are, are in progress because it's happening right now. Um, but there's a couple of universities. I think University of Washington is one of the big ones. Um, and uh, Carnegie Mellon, they're all looking at the, the effects of uh, Alexa in the home and what that means. So I, I think the answer is we don't know yet, um, but people are looking into it well, to figure it, it out. It reminds me of Jibo, when, when Jibo died, um, and there was a big, anyone who had the Jibo robot in their home and the kids grew attached to it, and there was the, the death of Jibo, if anybody had them, it's kind of sad. So like, what does that mean for our relationships with a voice assistant? Uh, it's an interesting concept. This, uh, we had the folks from BBC talk at one of our events a while back, and they built uh, voice skills for, for kids. And one of the things that was interesting there is how you uh, prompt kids for things. They get, they'd say, who do you want to play with? They would answer mom or dad. And so they had to say, do you want to play with you know, character A or B or C? They prompt them. That was kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, one. Is there a way you can make the instructions more general to cover your use cases without being specific? Um, what do you mean? Uh, I, I wish I could give you an example, but I don't know your example. <laughs>
if Jay gets better, you can do more of that. There was yeah. a, a book I used to come to our meetups. He had a travel chatbot, and it was one of the few ones where you could say, uh, uh, you know, I want to find a hotel someplace warm, and it would his NLP was able to decipher some of the stuff, the different entities, uh, versus like, you'd say first, I want to find a hotel, I want to go to this region, I want that too. Right. Like he would try to do a more conversational. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it just has to, some of the NLP get a little bit better to identify those in, entities inside the internet. So. Okay. Yeah, just, uh, this is fascinating. Yeah. I'm new, I don't know your space. Obviously, very exciting being at the size of the audience. Yeah. Can you give us a sense of how important voice is becoming? Voice, uh, how big is it? How fast it's growing? What the adoption are? Just some commentary around that. Uh, I, I knew I should have memorized those stats. <laughs> 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 oh, we, we ran some surveys. Uh, it, it was kind of interesting. Um, we should present them as tomorrow at Voice Summit if any of you guys are going to Voice Summit. Uh, but, but yeah, we, we ran a survey uh, this past uh, November and the November before of owners of Google Home and Alexa, you know, whether these things are behavior changing or not, or how often they use them. And it's something like, um, uh, for the behavior changing, I, I think it's about 75% say it's at least somewhat behavior changing, if not uh, very behavior changing. And the interesting thing, there's about 19% who said it's not behavior changing at all, but if you dive into it, those people, a third of them, say they use the device multiple times a day, and uh, like another nearly 20% said they use it at least once a day. So these people are saying, no, it's not behavior changing, but 50% are using it at least once a day. Um, uh, the other thing that was interesting, we dove a little bit deeper into was around uh, commerce, or people actually making purchases through these things. And uh, so far, at least from the survey, it's about 43% or so have made a purchase in the past. Um, but there's a, high likelihood of making a purchase in the, in the future. Uh, I think if they never made a purchase in the past, it's about 60, almost 70% willingness to do it in the future. And then if you have, it's almost like 90% will do it in the future. Most of the purchases are from the underlying store, the other Alexa or Google. Um, the, that's about 80 some percent. About 50% are from food ordering, exactly what you are talking about earlier, the reorder case. Um, partly because people are creatures of habit, I guess, to reorder the same thing, but also, also it's easier. Um, just on that note, one of the stats that was kind of interesting is when we, because it, it would break down gender and all these kind of things. Uh, do you know what one of the biggest indicator if someone was likely, uh, either made a purchase in the past or was highly likely to make a purchase in the future, do you know what it was? If they were male. If they were male? Uh, well, male is actually about one part of it, but it was more if they had both devices or not. If they were the owners of Google Home, and Alexa, it was like, if you had both of those, it was like 60% of those, the people, sorry, 60% of people that made purchases or very likely to make purchases own both devices. Um, versus like, it was like mid 30s on the Google and like low 40 for Alexa, if you just had one. So that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, on the B2B side, do you see, is this, I mean, you're doing this stuff, is there increasing usage? What are you finding? Well, we, uh, we just wrapped up our pilot, and uh, full rollout is in less than a week. So, um, what, well, we have projections from the pilot, so based on that, we think um, adoption is going to be pretty kick-ass. Um, let me think of this, like, I want to give you more. Like, I feel compelled to give you more than that, but, um, so, I'll, I'll say this. So, large audience of real estate agents across all those brands. We're concentrating on US before we branch out Canada and the other international and stuff. Um, you know, again, we were, we were wondering like, is this for everyone, right? You know, like, like voice does have like a type, right? There's a specific person who kind of gets this stuff or is curious enough about voice to, you know, forgive some of the things that, you know, maybe, uh, 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 help me out guys. You know, you know what I'm saying? So like, like, um, Yes, yeah, so there, there is a, there is, I'm not calling it a niche audience, but there's definitely a type of user um, and a crop, yeah, and early adopters, that sort of thing. Um, but even people who are like not die hard tech, like don't have the start button tattooed on their wrist, like that, uh, we do find that, that they are um, enthusiastic about this, you're gonna try it. Um, you know, a real estate agent to compete now has to be 
somewhat tech enabled. You know, I mean, except for the diehard veterans who are still using a Rolodex, that's like you know, that's a that's not the majority. But yeah, smartphones, tablets, you know, uh, mobile devices, and all that sort of thing. Voices, you know, I, I guess uh, the next frontier for them. So, voice as an interface, are we in sort of you know every technology has an adoption curve, right? Are we early on in that? And Very. you see this thing Super exploding or? Early. In my dreams, it explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming, right? Or, yeah. uh, I know there's other questions. I, I, I want to thank the audience. I uh, sorry, thank the uh, speakers. So you guys are uh, welcome to hang out thank and you. network and chat with folks. But really appreciate all uh, you guys doing this. This does some pizza and drinks and all that. Right? I know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take it. <laughs>